Welcome back to my channel. In today's video, I'm joined by Spike and we're joined by West Brom legend Chris Brim. So, Chris, how's your day been so far? Hey, fellas. Um, thanks for having me. Uh, yeah, it's been all right. I've um, not, not done an awful lot, to be totally honest. Went for a walk, had a, had a coffee. That was a, That's about it, really. There's not really an awful lot else to, else to do, is there? Nice. No. Uh, to be honest, we're living in a strange world at the moment. But you have you had a nice day so far, Spike? Yeah, yeah, good. Thanks. Just watching the cricket, England. Yeah, yeah. I had a good start today, England. Um, good to see. So, anyway, Chris, we'll start off today's podcast then by going back to your childhood. What would you say is your earliest ever football in memory? Um, probably just playing football in the street. I mean, uh, where my parents lived, there was just a, a little area just around the corner from from there from our house, and it was sort of there was it was it was it was like cul-de-sac. So obviously you couldn't really go too far, and the ball couldn't go too far, and we used to just play against the lamppost and uh, and the fence in my mom and dad's. Uh, around the corner from mom and dad's house and that's pretty much it really we had, we had a half decent half decent back garden as well but when it wasn't uh when it wasn't flooded so <laughs> i used to sort of uh, used to sort of alternate between the street and the and the garden and uh, what the weather's like depend, well and obviously in northern ireland the weather's not great so uh, nah. so my, uh, my cousin grew was up in bit. northern ireland Sorry? did you play for like a professional side or just a, like a club side no just a boys club team um Obviously, everything's changed a lot since since I was a kid. Like you know, um, it's got a bit more professional in Northern Ireland now that a lot of the clubs do have their own sort of academies and and, and youth teams right from the same, similar to what West Brom or Villa or whoever it would would be, you know, from under sevens or whatever it is right up. But when I was a kid, they didn't really have that. You sort of just played for your boys club team till you were sixteen, and then you maybe moved to an Irish league team, or if you obviously if you were lucky enough to get a, a professional contract at one of the one of the teams in England and Scotland. That was that was that was really the way for for us to go back then. Yeah, nice. So when you did get your first professional contract for Middlesbrough, describe to us your feelings. Especially, correct me if I'm wrong. When you unsuccessful at Rangers before, so yeah. Well, I used to go to Rangers when I was uh, from when I was ten right through till I was sixteen, just before I did my GCSEs, and I was sort of under the impression that I was going to get offered a contract there, and then right at the last minute they didn't. Uh, they had quite a few changes at, at that time in their in their youth setup there was there was a Dutch manager come in and they, they brought quite a lot of Dutch staff in like all the way down through the club and uh, they told me quite late that they weren't going to give me anything which obviously was was devastating because I really they tell you what uh, no not really I mean that's uh, it was my my mum my and dad phoned phoned up one I went I went over there on the Easter holidays just before I did my GCSEs and and they never really told me anything. And when I came back, I used to just fly over on my own for the weekend and uh, play a game and then come back. And my dad picked me up in the airport and he said, well, did they tell you anything? And I was like, no. So he phoned him, I think, that week and just to try and find out what was going on. Because obviously I would have had to like enroll back in school and stuff to go back and do my A-levels. So I needed to know. And, the, and they, they told my dad on the phone that they weren't going to offer me anything. And uh, luckily enough, the guy, the Middlesbrough scout, lived, lived not far from me. And he'd been asking me to go to, to Middlesbrough for, for a while on trial. And, so the, the following week of the Easter holidays, I went uh, I went to Middlesbrough for six days, I think, on my own. And uh, after about three days, they pulled me in and they said they, they wanted to offer me a contract, which was which was great. Obviously, it was it was pretty unexpected because I'd never really, obviously, I'd never been anywhere else really than, than Rangers as a kid. Nice. So as a kid at Middlesbrough, was there like a player you looked up to? Um. Not, not massively, no. I mean, Bills was first. Steve McLaren was the manager at Bills was first team. Um, they had, uh, so you, you, you see that this is what the, I'm going back to when you were, you probably weren't even born. Um, do you remember? Do you, do you ever see any videos of Janino and uh, when he played for Middlesbrough, the Brazilian, the little small Brazilian guy? No, I can't say enough. No, uh, <laughs> you, you're going, I'm going back before you, you two were born here. So, um, yeah, he 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 had signed and he. he He'd been there before, and he'd sort of came back for a second spell. So he was like the he was like the main player, but he, he had a real bad injury. And uh, I, I don't really remember too many first team players that I sort of that I really I really looked up to. To be totally honest, no. I mean, they, they obviously they had good players, but um, they had quite a lot of foreign players at the time as well. That sort of you know that we we just sort of did our own thing in the youth team and just tried to you, you basically just tried to get from the youth team into the reserves and then. If you were good enough in the reserves, you might have got a chance in the first team. And, and to be fair to Middlesbrough, I, 
they offer they they give a lot of lads a, a fair chance to to get into the first team. There's quite a lot of young lads that were the same age as me, similar age around that, that actually ended up playing for the first team quite a lot. Nice. I feel we have to talk a bit about Sheffield Wednesday as well. Obviously, it was a big part of your career. You played a whopping 134 games. Um, so what would you say is your best ever Sheffield Wednesday moment? Would it be when you got promoted from League One or um yeah, that was that was great. That'll be something that that I'll always remember. I mean, I'd never really experienced that anything like that before. I mean, when we were at Middlesbrough, we got to the, the final of the Youth Cup, but we lost uh, to Man United. So to sort of get the, the playoff final, and there was, you know, there's 45,000 Sheffield Wednesday fans there. You know, Sheffield Wednesday is a massive club, and um, people don't really see that anymore because obviously it's been a long time since they've been in the Premier League. But I mean, you know, we always used to get big, big crowds, even in League One. And, you know, in the playoff games, I think there was over 30,000 at the home game. And then obviously when we went to Cardiff, there were so many fans there. It was it was a great day. You know, I think personally, I, obviously I've, I've played better games than I did in the playoff final, but that, that'll be something that always sticks with me. And, and the group of players we had as well, you know, I've still got some good friends from that group. So, you know, it, was, it wasn't just about football. It was obviously, it was, you know, good for for myself personally and, and my wife as well. You know, we've still got a, a good group of friends that, that we all played together at Sheffield. Nice. Nice, yeah. So let's move on to your time at the Albion, which is probably the main part of this podcast. How did you become a West Brom player? And why did you move from Sheffield Wednesday? Like, what was the reasoning behind that move? Um, I think it was a bit of bit everything, really. You know, Sheffield Wednesday, had sort of, they'd sold a few players in the summer and they hadn't really replaced anybody. And, you know, they'd offered me a couple of new contracts at the time. And, and I, I just sort of thought that we weren't going to be as good, as strong as we were the season before. And, you know, I'd had a decent season. I think I'd scored 10 goals in the championship. At, and I was only 21. So, you know, obviously there was a few, there was a bit of interest from a couple of other clubs. And then obviously West Brom came in sort of late on. And, you know, Sheffield Wednesday weren't in very good financial position at the time as well. So obviously they got a decent a decent transfer fee as well. So it was a bit of everything really. You know, I, I think, look, I loved, I loved my time at Sheffield Wednesday, but it was it was probably the right time to move on. You know, they, they had a couple of years when they struggled for a little bit after after a few of us had left. So, you know, it's it sort of it worked out it worked out well for for both parties really you know they got good money for for me and they, they hadn't paid any money for me originally they got me in a free transfer and then obviously I got a, a move to West Brom which ultimately ended up me able to play in the in the Premier League which is something obviously that I always wanted to do nice so your first season for the club was a pretty special one for you personally and the whole team we obviously gained automatic promotion by winning the league and we also reached the FA Cup semi-final. What is it like being part of a team with this much success? And ha- describe to us like the feelings all around the club. And yeah, yeah, it was a, it was a great time. You know, it was some good people in the, in the club as well. I I knew Jonathan Greening from from Middlesbrough, and obviously James Morrison as well, who just signed there the week before me. So it wasn't going in the dressing room. We didn't know anybody, and they made me feel really welcome straight from the straight from the off. So that that was obviously a big part of it. And you know, obviously Tony Mowbray's team scored a we scored a lot of goals and. You know, it was it was entertaining, and you know, I think for a club to win the championship and get to the FA Cup semi final in one season, you know, that's you don't hear that very often for for from a championship team. So look, it was yeah, it was unbelievable to be involved in. You know, I I think looking back on it now, I'd probably rather have played a bit more game, a few more games than what I actually did. But you know, to, to be part of of that and you know to get promoted to the Premier League, which is obviously the the main aim for for me personally going there it was yeah it was it was a great season and you know to top it when off you, you signed for uh, how many years was a contract um i think it was four uh four. i'm not i'm not actually sure to be talking about i think it was four yeah <laughs> um yeah that sounds about right yeah so as well as being promoted, you've also been part of a couple of relegations. What is the feeling like around the club when you get relegated and how do you and the players around react mentally? Um, oh, it's disappointing, obviously. I think that first season when, when we got relegated, I think we'd struggled a lot of the season. So it wasn't, it was it was gotten, but you know it wasn't really unexpected, if that makes sense. You know, we sort of, we were never really... We never really give ourselves a chance of staying up, so it sort of it was a tough one to take. But you know the football club was well run, and we were able to hold on to majority of the players, which made us quite strong when we when we went back into the championship. So um, you know, it was 
it was gotten, but we always knew we were we were in with a good chance of coming straight back up, which was that was obviously the best part. I think the, the second time we got relegated from the Premier League a few years back when uh, what was that 2017, 20, 2017? Uh, that was that was more gotten for me personally because obviously you know I'd been there a long time and we'd worked very hard to stay in the Premier League all, all those years and you know through a number of different factors, obviously it sort of it all, all ended up in disappointment and. That was that, that that one hurt a lot more than the second one uh, than the first one, I think. Yeah, I so think in twenty seventeen that'd have to be my favourite game against Tottenham. Do you know when we won one 0 Oh yeah, last minute. Yeah, I think that's. I, I remember speaking about that at the time. I think that's one of the best atmospheres I've ever experienced in a football match in anywhere. You know that the atmosphere at the Hawthorns that day was unbelievable. You know when everything's against you and you need to win the game and yeah. You know, it, and it didn't. I think we'd sort of got a bit of a feel good thing back after, obviously, when Darren Moore took over, and we got a few quite, quite a few good results towards the back end of the season. And you know, it was that was an unbelievable atmosphere. It's just a pity we obviously couldn't. Uh, obviously, things were out of our hands at that stage, weren't they? So yeah, it was just a disappointment. Yeah, yeah, it was a shame. But anyway, let's move to a more probably positive subject than relegations. Over your time at the Albion, you've scored quite a lot of goals and brilliant goals. Um, the standout one for me was definitely that volley against Villa. But what would you say was your favourite goal for West Brom? Um, probably, uh, I don't know, actually. Uh, probably free kick yeah, at Everton. Free kick against Everton was pretty special. Yeah, that, that's probably one of my favourite ones. I, I think because we won the game as well, obviously that makes a big difference. You know, the, obviously the Villa goal, you, you score good goals and it doesn't actually get you any points in the game. You know, obviously we lost yeah. that night and... Um, yeah, that, that 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 sort of just dampens it for me. To be totally honest, you know, there's no point in scoring a good goal if you lose the game. So, yeah, the the, Villa, the Everton free kick is probably my favourite one. Plus, it was in, obviously it was in the Premier League against such a good a good team and a good goalie as well. Like, so you know, it sort of that sort of stands out a bit. But you know, obviously the Southampton goal from when we got promoted back in back in 2008 will always be one that that stands with you. It's not obviously it's not the best goal I've ever scored, but it's probably one of the obviously one of the most important ones. Yeah, I actually made a video when you uh, announced that you was leaving the club in the summer of all your best goals. And it reminded me of quite a few and makes you realise how many great goals you did score. So <laughs> Yeah, he said, um, look, look, at I always I like to shoot. I mean, that's, you shoot from far out, you sometimes going to score a decent goal, aren't you? So, um yeah, look, I, I think I seen. I think somebody actually sent me the video when we were just chatting off before you started recording about the thing, and obviously yeah. somebody sent me the video. Yeah, so look, I've had loads of loads of nice messages and, and videos from when I left, and you don't really think about it very much when you're playing because you're focused on your on doing your job as best you can for the for the team. But you know, the the sort of you know, for people to feel that way about you for, at, at a football club, it's it, it, it's great, and you know, obviously, hopefully, when everybody gets back into the stadiums and we're able to go to the games I'll, I'll be able to come back and say say bye to everybody properly because you know the last 18 months have, have been great for for anybody football wise have they yeah I mean you did have obviously your last game for the club was a great game obviously we got promoted but would you have preferred to do it in front of the fans like would you have preferred like a good sending off you could well you've seen players like Odin Wingy come back to the Hawthorns they you might get one in the future yeah, yeah. Look, obviously, it would be much better if there had been fans in the stadium just for that night as well, because it was, you know, we achieved something we'd worked hard for all season, and not be able, not to be able to celebrate it in front of a stadium where there's, you know, empty seats. I, I think football this year has been it's been tough all around. You know, it's not the same playing in an empty stadium. It's not the same for everybody watching on TV. With, you know, you don't hear any. You just hear people shouting and screaming from the touchline. That you know that it's it's pretty much it's like training games, really, isn't it? You know, and I know it's it's not because obviously there's stuff riding on the games, but it's it's just not the same, and you know it's disappointing for that. And yeah, obviously my last game for for West Brom, such a, it's a club that means a lot to me and my my family. It would have been nice to to have uh, to have people there, but you know that's. No, there's not really an awful lot we can do. I remember, like, uh, everyone went up for the corner and then Slavin Bilic, like, screamed to him to get back when Brentford were losing. Yeah, well, it's a funny, lead. It's a funny story, that, because cool. he sort of, he, pull, he pulled us in in the morning of the game and said, to us, like, this is what's going to happen if we need to win the game. We're going to... And he pulled me in as well. And obviously, I hadn't played a lot of football. And I was sort of thinking, well, what's he pulling me in for, you know? Because <laughs> I'll probably not play anyway. But he, he pulled us in and he said, look, this is what's going to happen if we need to 
we need to win the game. It was basically five up front and like two at the back. It was just, it was mad, like, you know, if we needed to go and get a goal. And so for a while, it sort of looked as if we would have had to win the game. And then obviously when we got news on from Barnsley had scored against Brentford, hadn't they? And, you know, everybody was like, and he was yeah. trying to scream on to get everybody. It was, it was a bit, uh, it was a bit mad to be fair, but, uh, you know, we got there in the end. It wasn't, uh, it wasn't very pretty, but we, we just about fell over the line, didn't we? Yeah. yeah. So you've played under some great managers over your time for West Brom, but who would you say is the best one to play under? Um, I like Roy Hodgson the best, um, just purely because of how much he sort of developed us as a team. You know, um, he was one of those coaches. You, you, he could have literally played anybody anywhere, and you would have known what to do. He was just—he was just such a good coach. And I think he, he brought us on from being a team that sort of got promoted, got relegated, got promoted, got relegated. And he, he made us a, a Premier League team for the, for those years, for those couple of seasons he was here, and that was the sort of foundation that those the years we were in the Premier League was were built on. And, I felt personally that I learned uh, the most from him about in about football and out of, out of all the managers I've had. And that's obviously not disrespecting any other ones. I just feel he had the, the biggest influence on my career. Yeah, nice. We have had. So, would you say that was the best team you've played under, like the um, best group of lads? Yeah, not necessarily the best team. Like uh, we had, obviously we added to that. Like he, he the sort of team. I think when you. If you look at the sort of the core of players we had, like uh, Ben Foster, Boaz, Garth McCall, Jonas, James Morrison, Stephen Reid, Ridgewell, people, you know, myself, Yusef Malumbu, people like that, you know, that uh, were there for a few years and you sort of, you don't change too far away from that that team of players. It, it, I think it made a big difference for us in the, in the Premier League. You know, everybody sort of grew together in the, in the league rather than, you know, you see a lot of teams chopping and changing players an awful lot and, Sometimes it just doesn't work out, and and you know I think when we had a good bit of stability in that side, it, it, it made us a better team. Yeah, nice. So moving on to a question that will interest most West Bromwich Albion fans. Obviously, you do you do currently help out with a bit of your son's team, halfway juniors, a bit of coaching there. <laughs> Once you've announced retirement, um, do you think you could potentially go into coaching in the professional game, maybe even a job at the Albion? Would you consider that or? Um, yeah, look, I think that's probably the natural step. You know, I, I would like to probably have a go at it. Um, I think if somebody seen me trying to coach my sons under nine team, I don't think, or under 10 team, I don't think they would be too impressed. Um, they're, uh, they, run, they run riot when I'm, when, when I'm trying to help out. So um, hopefully the, <laughs> the, older, the older lads would, would listen a little bit more than, than a group of nine-year-olds and 10-year-olds. But yeah. Um, no, it's uh, it's it's something I'll, I'll I'll I'm interested in doing. Um, I've done some coaching qualifications through uh, through the Irish FA in, in Belfast over the last few seasons. So hopefully, um, yeah, hopefully I'll I'll be able to do something. But you know, at the minute I'm just still sort of trying to trying to rehab my um, my injury and and just yeah. take it from there. Hopefully. Yeah. So staying with West Brom, how proud are you? Uh, being captain of the team for so long. Yeah, look, that, that was one of the, the highlights of my career. Obviously, looking back at it, you don't think a lot about it at the time. I think, you know, you, you sort of, you go on the pitch and you just try and do your job as best you can. And, and hopefully that everybody else sort of sees you trying your best to do do things properly. And, and then they, they, they follow suit. You know, I don't think, you know, I, I wasn't really one for shouting and screaming or trying to, you know, get people together and, and doing stuff like that. Uh, you try and you try and do your own job as as best you can and help as many other people around you as you can on the field and on the training pitch. You know, I don't think, and the group of lads that we had that I mentioned before were were so good at that anyway. You know, you didn't really have to do a massive amount to to, to get them going. You know, everybody looked out for themselves or looked looked after each other. And you know, if somebody wasn't pulling their weight, they were, you know, they were told quickly about it. How did it come about? Who gave you a lot of role? Who gave you the opportunity? Um, I, I, kind of, I think it was Roy Hodgson, but I, I'm not 100%. I think, I think uh, Robbie DiMatteo maybe gave me it a couple of times when um, Scott Carson got left out of the team a couple of times and, and then they sort of bypassed Jonas, who was vice-captain at the time, but I'm not sure whether he maybe didn't want to do it or, or what actually went on, but you know, they said, oh, you're a captain and you sort of just 
you know, all right, fair enough. Like he didn't really think much about it. And then obviously when Roy Hodgson came in, he, he just sort of kept me there. And Scott came back in the goals. But I think, you know, at the time, I think he just wanted Scott to just concentrate on, on, on being the goalie. Like, so they just left it with me. And, you know, it was one of those things. And you just got on with it. It was it's sometimes... Obviously, it happened to me when when Darren Fletcher came in and he, and, and he got he, he sort of took it off me and made made him captain. But you know, it's it's a bit weird. But you, know, you just get on with it. You know, that's that's just part and parcel of it. And it didn't really matter who, in my opinion, who wore the armband. You know, it's obviously an honour to have it. Like, but you know, I think everybody should be going out and, and doing their best anyway. So, yeah, definitely. You see, in the current Albion team, there's a few leaders in the team. Obviously, Jake Livermore's the main captain. But you see players like Carl Bartley. Like, it looks to me, I'm not sure in the dressing room, but he looks like a good leader on the pitch on in defence. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, he, I think especially in that league, I mean, it was always going to be tough for West Brom this year. It was always going to be a, a difficult season. You know, they had a, they've had they got a really strong championship team, as was proved last year. But, you know, obviously the money that they spent was to, to, to get that team back together. You know, they've not, they don't have an awful lot of Premier League experience. And I think... When you step up, you see that that that's that is a big thing that players that know the Premier League is is a big it's it's a big thing to have and you know obviously uh, that's it's not always easy to get that because as a smaller club in that in that league it's it's difficult to um, to to push on really you know I mean it, it was always going to be a tough season for them this season and you know it's been disappointing watching obviously them not not pick up many points but there's still a bit of football left and. With the new, the with Sam Allardyce in there now, obviously he knows the league a lot, and he's brought a couple of players in. So hopefully they'll have a strong end of the season. But you know it's going to be an uphill uphill battle for them. Yeah. Just quickly, would you have slapped Billic when we did? <laughs> he can't. He can't be asking me questions like that. Put me in the spot. <laughs> uh, obviously he did a he did a really good job. You know he brought in to get get us promoted out of that league last year, and he did a great job with it. And, it's the same thing. It's it, the Premier League is such a tough league, and you know, obviously, as a football club, you know, there's so much money involved in staying in the Premier League as well. You've got to, I suppose, it's a bit of a gamble. You've got to roll the dice at some stage if things aren't going well, and obviously, the football club have done that, and it's it's difficult. It, it is a difficult one to to decide, really. I know it wouldn't be a decision I would want to do, but you know, that's yeah. it's a harsh environment, and you'll you'll <laughs> you see that as as you get a bit older, you realise how how cutthroat it is. Yeah. Is it a big shame, but as you say, it's up to the club and they thought it's the right decision. But anyway, in one of your last games for the club, you played against our rivals, Aston Villa, in the playoffs. Obviously, you didn't have the best of games for your high standards. Uh, you got sent off. How frustrated were you on, on that day? And I bet you was glad it weren't your last game for the club. Um, yeah, look, I think that's one of those things. You know, I don't... I've, I've not. I think I've only been sent off twice before that in my career, and like in front of nothing. And yeah, it was just one of those things. I, I you know, everybody makes mistakes, and it came at the wrong time. You know, it was I was gutted, like because I think you know we had a good chance of we had a good chance of winning against Aston Villa that night. But I think if you look at it, you know the obviously the first leg when when Dwight got sent off as well, and then we were missing yeah. Hal Robson and then Jay Rodriguez got injured in the semi final as well. I think everything sort of just stacked up against us and. You know, obviously me getting sent off was was a big catalyst for 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 that not happening. But you know that's that's football, isn't it? You know, you yeah. just you live yeah. and learn, don't you? And you know, the following season we we managed to make up for it. And, you know, that was I was gutted that and I, I didn't get a chance to play in the Premier League again for West Brom because that would have been obviously the that would have been the perfect way to end my time at the club. But you know, I was glad that I was part of the team that that ended up getting getting us back there. Yeah. So then let's move on to your time with Northern Ireland. Then, so we will start off by asking you probably a very tough question, but you picked up that injury in 2016, Mm -hmm. which then resulted in you not being able to play in the Euros. Describe to us emotions when you found out you wouldn't be able to play. Yeah, I think when when I hurt my knee, I knew it was pretty bad straight away. Like I'd never really had anything like that before, so I knew it wasn't good and... uh, yeah, I went to see that happened on the Saturday evening and I went with the doctor to the hospital on the Sunday and I found out on the Sunday morning. So yeah, I was gutted because obviously you go away for every international break for ten years and, and you know, we we struggled as a as a country for a long time before before Michael O'Neill took over. And you know, when you actually get a bit of success and you get a chance to go to a tournament and then obviously to have it taken away, it's that's 
that's part and parcel of the game. You know, I've always been quite lucky with injuries, and I tried to sort of, I tried to look at it like that because, you know, I knew straight away that I wasn't going to be able to play in the tournament, and there was, you know, lads that end up missing out tournaments with like I don't know calf problems in training the week before the games or pulling a hamstring at the tournament or something like that. So, you know, I think that was I'd probably rather had that than you know sort of live in fear of something happening the week before the tournament. You know, so. It was nice to be able to go and be involved. I did a bit of media work for BBC covering the Northern Ireland games and you know, I was able to go out and, and enjoy being at the tournament and sort of almost experiencing it a bit like a fan, really, you know, and, and still have the sort of opportunity to be around the, the team too. But obviously nothing really, nothing takes um, nothing takes up the place of playing and you know, that, that's, that's, yeah. that's life, isn't it? Yeah, it's a big shame, but... Would you say playing alongside Gareth McCauley, Johnny Johnny Evans, and maybe even Chris Baird at a time for club and country helped you? Or I think it probably definitely helped us as as a defence, yeah, because you know Gareth and Johnny were obviously the two centre halves nine times out of ten that Michael would have picked. Craig Cathcart, obviously from from Watford, was there thereabouts as well. But then obviously I was playing left back at the time, so yeah, it probably did help, and you know we all sort of knew each other so well playing playing week in, week out beside each other at the football club as well. It probably did benefit us. And you know, I think we just had a good group, a good strong group of lads as well. You know, I think everybody sort of knew there was no airs and graces, but anyway, there was no big egos or anything. We just got on with it. And, you know, as, you know, we just did, we just played well and played well for each other. You know, we weren't a good, we weren't really like a fancy football team. We, just, we were just efficient and, you know, we, we got some good results along the way in qualifying. And, you know, as you get a bit, build a bit of momentum, and you know things sort of go with you. And the atmosphere in in Belfast for the international games is is unbelievable, you know, as well. And, and that that definitely helps too. Yeah. Nice. What would you say your most memorable moment was for playing for Northern Ireland? Um. Probably in that qualifying campaign. You know, the the night the night we qualified against Greece in Belfast was uh, that was one of those nights. It was it was an unbelievable experience you know the the stadium wasn't fully finished at the time though so it sort of there wasn't as many people there as there probably could have been but um and then in the in the qualifying campaign leading up to the the world cup playoffs as well it was some there were some pretty special atmospheres in in that as well you know i, I managed to score a goal against um czech republic at home and that that, that pretty much sort of that when the win that night pretty much guaranteed as a playoff place as well so that was you know stuff like that but, you know, there was a lot of times playing for Northern Ireland was difficult as well. So, you know, you sort of, it sort of evens itself out probably. But, uh, you know, those those last few years playing was, yeah, it was, it was really good. Yeah, nice. Uh, sorry. So the next question for you, uh, Chris, is another Northern Ireland question. What would you say, who would you say was the toughest opponent you came up against for Northern Ireland player or team or both? <laughs> I mean, there was a few. Um uh, we played Portugal and Ronaldo scored a hat trick in Belfast against us one night. Um, actually, got sent off in that game as well, so we're we'll probably not talking about that. Um, but yeah, obviously he was a different class. Like you know, he sort of gave him three chances and he scored three goals in the last ten minutes of the game. You know, it was just a big difference. But the last few campaigns, we always got drawn against Germany, and you know, we played them in the Euros and they beat us one nil. But it was like the most one sided one nil you've ever seen. Uh, yeah. And then game as well in Belfast we we played them in the World Cup qualifying campaign and they, they beat us 3-1 but it was like literally like you just don't know where they're coming from you know you sort of can't get out of your own half you've got so much, they're just so good as a team as well like obviously they've got great individual players but as a team they were always they were always really really good I had, <clears throat> had a few couple of tough games against them yeah nice so you must have played at some many great grounds playing for Northern Ireland but what would you say your favourite one was Apart from Northern uh, Ireland, like away, uh, away. Just trying to think. Um, I don't. I, do you know, I, I don't really recall playing against too many teams in like great stadiums. You know, I, I don't think we played Romania in Bucharest, and they had just a new stadium built at the time. It's, it's pretty impressive. Like, um, but I don't think there was too many. Other ones like that really stood out, you know. A lot of, I think, when you go to a lot of, a lot of European teams, they have sort of older stadiums that, that are, um, and then obviously as the sort of time moved on, they, everybody sort of gets to the sort of, you know, like the newer looking stadiums that are that are built for tournaments and stuff like that. So, yeah. um, 
one of the one of the ones that stands out for me the most. We played Serbia in a. It was actually behind closed doors because they had some crowd trouble. I think I can't remember what year it was. It was like maybe like twenty eleven or twenty twelve. And uh, it was like a big, massive, uh, it's Red Star Bel- Belgrade's ground. And so right. it's like a big, really old, really old stadium with like all open sides and like no roof on the stands and stuff like that. But there was nobody there, but it was really, really intimidating all around it and stuff. And that one always sticks out to me for some reason. I, I don't really know why, but it was just, yeah, it was just a really old school stadium with a big, massive running track around it. And, this, and the training, gr- the, the changing rooms were probably a good maybe 200 meter walk. You had to go like down a tunnel and then underneath the stand to get the changing rooms. And it was, excuse me, it was really, it was weird. And I got drug tested actually after the game and me and the doctor had to stay behind afterwards for the, for the drug test. And like they locked the stadium doors and stuff. We were the last people to leave and then pitch black at like half 12 at night. It was, uh, it was a bit scary. Yeah. I, I've seen uh, red star Belgrade's fans. They're a bit crazy. I've seen them in a few yeah. European nights, but Yeah. <laughs> Anyway, yeah. Um, so, wait, hold on. To end today's podcast, then, um, we've asked a few Albion fans if they could send in a few questions for you to like answer. Like, There's five of them. So um, do you want to ask the first one, Spike? Uh, okay. So the first one comes from a Baggy's perspective on Instagram, and he asks, how would you describe the West Brom fan base? How would I describe the West Brom fan base? Um, yeah, they, look, they were always brilliant with me uh, personally. Like, uh, I think they're pretty, they're pretty realistic fans. I think you know they, they know their football, and you know obviously they've, I think back at, they've had a lot of success back in the past. You know, with the the sixties and seventies teams. You know, you hear about all the all the legends from the past. So they've been they've been used to success, more successful times than what they've had over the last last bit of, bit of time, but. I think ninety nine percent of the time they were always really good for us. They they got behind us and supported as well. And at the end of the day, everybody pays their money, and if you know if they're not happy with something, they've got the right to they've got the right to have a to have a bit of a moan a, a moan and a groan. But you know that's that's. I'm awesome. gonna say I remember I was at Reading away in the FA Cup, and then <laughs> one of our fans threw a coin. Yeah, but that isn't that wasn't too good. <laughs> no, but that's like that's a small minority, isn't it? You get some. Obviously, you get yeah. some idiots everywhere and every walk of life, don't you? And you know, I think if you, obviously, if you ask the the lad what what he was thinking at the time, you know, he'd probably be pretty embarrassed about it. Now, I'd like to hope he was, but you know, that's that's life, isn't it? You know, that you know, for, yeah. for the thirteen years I was there, that's probably the worst thing that could have happened, and it was only once. So, <laughs> yeah, I always say it was a good shot, though. He's done well to pick me out from that far away with the coin, like, but obviously, you don't. You don't want to see it happen to anybody. I would say, because I remember, I think you were like the only player to come over and say thanks to us for like coming and that. I think, yeah, I, I always thought that was important. You know, I mean, no matter how badly you'd played or how well you'd think you'd played or whatever, you know, at the end of the day, people pay a lot of money to come and, and watch watch us play. And, you know, the least you can do is show a better appreciation for it. And I always just thought that. I mean, I think that's just general. That's not me. I think that's just general yeah. life. You know, you show appreciation for people that are there to, to back you up and support you. And you know, we didn't play well as a team that day, but you know, there's been a lot of times when we have played well as a team and it shouldn't make any difference. If you win, lose or draw, you should always show a bit of appreciation, I think. Yeah, definitely. Um, yeah. But you, you going back to the fans, obviously it is a small minority and they ruin it for the rest. But I suppose you get that in most clubs. Obviously, you seem recently like some racist stuff to remain Sawyers. It does ru- it, It's a very, very small minority minority but it ruins it for the rest of the fans but anyway yeah it is of course and like obviously with social media and stuff like that it's it's difficult to stop things like that happening now isn't it so you know it's a it is a, it's a difficult it's a difficult scenario but you know until something's done about things like that there's not really an awful lot else you can you can say about it is there yeah anyway moving on to the next question the baggies bible on instagram asks what is your favorite moment play as a player for west brom um for, yeah probably probably getting promoted in in that first season in 2008 you know i think that sort of set we get that i'd always wanted to play in the premier league from when i was five six years old in belfast so you know being able to to, to score the goal to get us there to, to sort of achieve that that goal that that was that was always something that would be very special with me and 
probably something that I'll 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 be remembered for at the football club as well, which is obviously great. But you know, there's been so many good times. You know, it's hard to it's hard to put. Were you involved in the five one at Molyneux? Or? No, I was injured that day. I didn't I didn't play in that. Um, I've been involved in a couple of good games against against Villa. Obviously, I, sco- I, I scored against Wolves that earlier on in the season in the five one game. I think uh, did we we won two 0 at home. Yeah, I think I, I scored a goal in that game. You know, just things yeah. like that stand out. You, you don't think an awful lot about it at the time because you know it's sort of, well, it's, you're still sort of young and you're still trying to, you're trying to just sort of do your job and do, and do the best you can. But obviously now when you've got a bit of time to sit back and think about it, you know, it's, it's obviously probably a bit more special than what it now than what it felt at the time. Yeah. So Freddie WBS asked. Would you ever come back to the Albion as a fan and watch uh, when were the fans are allowed? Yeah, absolutely. I think you know my my little boy's my he's ten in April and he, he's well into his football. Like he he doesn't really massively like watching football, but I think as he's getting a little bit older now, he's asking a few more questions. And you know, he spent a lot of time when he was young coming to watch me play and, and but not really understanding. So I think now when he understands a little bit more, I think. It'd be nice to be able to take him back and, and and watch 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 West Brom, yeah. Because obviously, I still live in the area, and you know, it'd be nice to, to it'd be nice to sit back and and uh, shout a few things at the ones on the pitch rather than be the ones getting shouted at. Yeah, definitely. So yeah. WBA fan TV asks a similar sort of question: What is your favourite Albion game? Um. I don't really know. <laughs> that that one that, that Spike mentioned before about the, the Spurs game at, at home. Oh yeah. Uh, although we ended up getting relegated that season, that, that was a that was an unbelievable game. Just the atmosphere that the whole day and even there was a few games at the back end of that season. Even the, the Liverpool game the, the, the week before, I think we, we were two 0 down and we drew two each with Liverpool and it sort of stopped them. It stopped yeah. them winning the league really more or less and uh, we needed to beat. We won at Old Trafford as well. Yeah. yeah. So. You know, ultimately it was disappointing in the end because we because we got relegated. Like, but you know that that game against Spurs at, at the Hawthorns that day that that'll be that will be a difficult one to to forget. I think. Yeah. Nice. Were you on the pitch at the time when we scored? Yeah, yeah. I should have scored. It, it, it came back to me, and I sort of hit it against the goalie on the line, and then Jake. I remember. Went, I was wondering why you weren't taking the corner at the time because yeah. Phillips took it, didn't he? Matt Phillips took it, yeah, yeah. I sort of, yeah, we, that was always quite successful for us, wasn't it? You know, Matt Phillips sort of took him from one side and I took him from the other and we always, we were always pretty, uh, yeah. pretty successful with it. Like, so, you know, I, I was actually in the box. I think I, I never really went into the box for corners, but obviously there was only a few minutes left and I thought, well, I might as well go in. So, and I obviously, <laughs> I ended up, I probably should have scored to be totally honest, yeah. but it fell, on, it fell on my right foot, so I missed it. Yeah, I, I obviously sit in the Woodman corner, <laughs> so you used to take the corners from that oh. corner. I yeah, yeah. Uh, the Baggies Bulletin asks, um, if you was if you was to go into coaching, um, what would you be what would be your ideal job? <laughs> um I better say West Brown manager on that. Um yeah. I don't I, I do you know what I've not really thought much about it because I wanted to play as long as I could and obviously this season with at Bristol City I was enjoying it and then obviously the injury sort of came out of the blue and it was disappointing, but uh, now I've obviously got to think a little bit more about what I want to do afterwards. So um, I think you've seen, you know, you, I've been, a, I've seen a lot of people in at West Brom, obviously different managers, different coaches and stuff. And I'd like to think that I've learned enough from, from all those people, good and bad, that stuff that maybe might help me along the way. So yeah, look, I would, lo- I would love to have a crack at it at some stage if, if, if the opportunity arose, but you know, I, I think first and foremost, you've got to get in and, and do some coaching and make a few mistakes along the way because that's uh, there's no you can't just get thrown straight in the deep end. I don't think without uh, without without practicing first. So it's the same as everything, isn't it? You've got to, yeah, you've got to practice to get better at it. So you know, hopefully, um, we'll see if uh, it depends on if the if lockdown ends and they open the golf courses up, it might change my might change my attitude to stuff. I might just go and try and get better at golf. Yeah. Obviously, we've seen probably one of your best friends, James Morrison, get into coaching. Um, there's been talk all over the Albion social media. We'd love to have you and James Morrison uh, as our coaches. Could you see that <laughs> in the future? Or? Um, okay. 
<laughs> yeah, I would, I would, I would like to obviously go back and obviously at West Brom because it's a club that means a lot to me, and I would like to have a go at it if I, if, I, if the opportunity arose. But you know, obviously, there's a lot of there's a lot of people in the same boat. There's there's a lot of people wanting coaching jobs and, and are better qualified for coaching jobs than what I am. So, you know, if the opportunity came up and and I was able to go and, and do a bit of coaching with West Brom, yeah, I would love to. But look, we'll see what happens and uh, you know, just take it from there. I think. Yeah, definitely. Do you think you might have another season in you? Yeah. <laughs> or do you think that's it? I don't. I don't know. I, I I think being out for so long last year, not really playing much football last year, and then being out for so long this season, I think it'd be difficult for somebody to sign a, a 36, nearly 37 year old in the summer. But look, I'll, I'll try my best to get as fit as I can and, and see what happens. But look, I'm not uh, I'm not holding my breath. But I, you know, when the up, it's difficult to say that because you've got to. You know, once you once you make a decision not to play again, that's that's it finished, and you know that's all I've known since I was 16 years old. So, you know, it's uh, it's a it's a, it's a big decision, but you know, I'll make sure that uh, I take plenty of time to think about it. Yeah, definitely. Um, does that wrap up today's podcast, Spike, or have you got any more questions? Uh, no, that's it okay. for me. Yeah, so that does wrap up today's podcast. Thank you very much, Chris, for coming on. Um, Cheers. The, what, no probably my favorite ever football player. So I'm really happy <laughs> I've been able to speak to you. Um, and yeah, I'll see everyone in the next video.